Well, welcome to Paleopedology. Today, I want to talk about mapping and naming of paleosols. I've always found um, that the soul scientists beat us to this idea and tried to pattern my own uh, description and naming of paleosols after what the soul scientists do. After all, they've been tremendously successful with county soil surveys. Um, one of the aims of learning the taxonomy is to deal with this massive accumulation of information, specific information, about land use that's encoded in the uh, soil surveys of the NCRS. The idea um, is that each soil is an individual and has its own name. And there's a system of naming modern soils that can be easily applied to paleosols as well. <clears throat> um, let's look quickly at um, how <clears throat> they uh, characterize um, the um, mapping of uh, soils um, here in the Willamette uh, in the Willamette Valley. Um, they have a, um, a definition of uh, different kinds of soils on different terraces of the um, Willamette River. So if this is the um, Eugene Formation here, and here's the alluvium of the Willamette River, this is bedrock of um, late Eocene age. Um, how all it, how our whole area is being uplifted. And so there is a system of terraces. They're quite striking as you drive north uh, in the Willamette Valley. Uh, you'll see these terraces uh, that are in um, Pleistocene gravels. Um, and they're all in set as the Willamette River here. This is the Willamette River. <coughs> has excised itself into an uplifting um, four-arc um, basin. There's a terrace here, here's a terrace here, and these terraces reflect um, land surfaces of um, different um, ages. What you see on a soil, on a county soil map from NCRS, is a whole bunch of soil series. Um, the soil series are a name uh, for a, a particular kind of soil um, which is assumed to have the same general properties uh, for land uh, use. Um, they are named uh, from uh, locations. This is the Aola Hills outside of Salem there. So we're in the middle Lambert Valley here. Um, uh, for example, uh, Bell Pine. Uh, Venita, uh, Data, um, Chehalis, uh, and then um, we have Chehalis again here. Um, these are um, the, um, oh, and Camus down in here, the, in the very bottom, Camus in areas that are away from um, the river itself. Uh, the river is not a soil necessarily, especially if it's, if it's flowing. But where it's dry, um, yeah, that's the soil. Um, these soil series are named after localities. Um, these are places in the valley where that soil was first dug. Um, the soil series is mapped as what's called a polypedon. <clears throat> the polypedon, you can imagine, as being a piece of the landscape that has the same sort of soil on it, and it's a polypedon because it's based on a pedon. A pedon is uh, a single soil pit. Uh, so you dig a pit, you're not going to dig up the whole landscape and make sure it's the same everywhere. You're going to dig a representative set of pits, or you're going to do some auger holes, uh, something like that, 
Um, you need you definitely need a pit to do the first description, but after that you might be able to supplement it with observations from augers, um, just hand uh, drilled holes. Um, but the basic idea um, is that um, we have a set of observations scattered about the landscape of um, pedons, and then we integrate those, um, and we see where all those pedons fall on the landscape, and then we map them out as to where we think the same kind of soil is also uh, present. So a soil series is a name um, for um, a general kind of soil. Um, so um, this is independent now of the identification of the soils. Uh, it turns out that the bell pine is a haplohumol. Um, it's an ultrasol. The Veneta is a haplozerol. <clears throat> that's an alpha sol uh, in a summer dry climate. That's the zero part. Um, the Dayton um, is an albacloth. So now we're dealing with a lowland soil, an alpha sol that has a tendency to be a little bit waterlogged and has an albic horizon. Um, it has a, a leached uh, surface to it. Chehalis and Camus are both haplozerols, both mollusols. <clears throat> now these terms are embedded in there, um, but um, these names are something quite a bit more specific. So um, the haplo, this instead of saying mapping haplohumor, haplozerol, albacore, haplozerol, the bell pine is a particular haplohumor for a particular area and for a uh, particular climatic region uh, defined precisely on these soil uh, maps. There are plenty of haplohumors elsewhere, like in Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, uh, but these have different um, names. Um, the series names are meant to be uh, quite specific to a particular locality <clears throat> because there are so many factors and factors of soil formation will be the next section of this course, so many factors involved <clears throat> that you want it to be quite specific so that people using this uh, classification can expect similar results to um, what the soil mappers got when they tested them for such things as um, strength, um, for uh, yields of different crops, um, and for uh, general fertility. Um, we can also group things together. <clears throat> we can have um, a, a, an association of forest soils and an association of grassland soils. So, uh, we can uh, group these uh, into a Chehalis and a Belpine association. Um, we can also be very specific. We can name a particular one. For example, the Belpine Silty clay loam. Um, the silty clay loam is a part of the textural triangle that we use in soils, um, which has sand, <coughs> silt, and clay. Uh, so this is around about here, pretty central. Uh, it's defined by the texture of the A horizon. <coughs> Uh, you can name an individual soil. You can also have the bell pine eroded phase. <clears throat> if you recognize that a part of the soil is eroded, <clears throat> an eroded phase, or the bell pine nodular variant, sometimes these soils have uh, ferruginous nodules in them, uh, you can name nodules as well. So this is a, a system that has um, quite a bit of uh, flexibility uh, for naming 
individual pellet soils, group, individual soils, groups of soils, and uh, specifying and mapping their position with respect to the uh, landscape. Now, um, <clears throat> that's modern soils. What about what about fossils? What about paleosols? How do we name those? Well, it depends on what you want to do. Um, there are different names for different kinds of um, uses of, for paleosols. Um, what I'm largely about is paleoenvironments. I want to use the soils uh, as a guide to understanding ancient environments, independent of the fossil record or other maybe geochemical lines of evidence. Um, I'm very interested um, in figuring out <clears throat> what kinds of vegetation, uh, what kinds of um, durations of, of formation, what kind of waterlogging regime, um, all of these ancient features from the record of just paleosols um, themselves. Uh, I use a system which is called pedotypes. <coughs> I coined this word uh, in 1994 because um, it equals soil series. <coughs> a pedotype is a soil uh, series. Why do we need a new word? Uh, well, that's because this is this this word is problematic. This in geology is also a chronostratigraphic term. So you have, for example, the Comanche series and the Trinity series, uh, two thick sequences of rocks um, in the Cretaceous of uh, of Texas. Um, these are um, the kinds of units that are time rock units. They employ they uh, have a meaning which includes time as well as um, rock thickness. And so um, they are um, confusing. If we talk about um, a, a paleosol series, um, that's going to be confusing to geologists. And most of our work on paleosols is, of course, um, in geological uh, journals. And so I coined this new word. Um, and I mean pedotypes to be exactly the same as soil series. For example, uh, the Gleska. Type. Uh, that means I can also have a Gleska silt loam for a specific profile which I've measured um, the grain size in. Um, and uh, what I mean is a, a soil profile, um, a paleosol profile, which I think is representative of others just like it uh, within the same sort of uh, sequence. Why did I use Gleska? Well, I used Gleska um, because it's a Native American word uh, from the Sioux language. Uh, it means uh, mottled. It was a very famous um, Native American Sioux chief who battled with um, uh, the uh, U.S. cavalry um, in the 19th century called Sinti Gleska. Uh, and he um, had, a, had a, spotted, um, uh, a spotted pony. Uh, that he that he wrote that was the the idea of, of the name it means it means mottled um, and I use um, Native American Native Aboriginal uh, uh, Tibetan native languages Dongxiang language in China um, because all the other names are pretty much taken um, when you think about all the names that are used in soil survey maps uh, and all the names that are used for geological formations um, and for geological facies. Um, well, you, you, you have to cast about a little more broadly. Uh, in Antarctica, I decided just to name the, the soil pedotypes after the first names of uh, different geologists that have worked there. So we have uh, Paleosol Evelyn, uh, Paleosol Rosemary, Paleosol uh, Gregory, Paleosol uh, Sean. Um, my great regret is we don't have a Paleosol Bob. I think that would have been pretty awesome, but there was um, there was no real Bob that we could justify uh, with, and and the, the reviewers didn't uh, didn't like it either. So um, we name them fairly arbitrarily because um, the names don't matter. What they actually 
accomplish is a particular kind of a palisol. A, it's based on a type profile. There's always a type profile. So we've always excavated one particular example and then gone to town on it, uh, sampled it, got geochemistry, got grain size, um, got um, all the details we can on it, and that's the reference one. Uh, you just go back to that profile. Um, if you have another one that you want to compare with, is it the same or is it different? Uh, and so you build up um, a, often a fairly uh, complicated uh, headotype uh, terminology. Um, we use um, what we know from um, modern environments, um, like uh, the Willamette Valley that I just explained. Uh, we want them to more or less correspond to different taxonomic units. Um, and one of the things that's really characteristic of pedotypes is their, is their age. So if you have um, a, a pedotype that has a nice BT horizon, an A over a BT, it's, that's going to be quite different from um, a pedotype of an immature paleosol, uh, which has only root traces, or an A over a C uh, profile. It's these general observations of soils that we use to define um, the pedotypes. But each one is an individual, and we can actually name individuals as well from the texture of the A, uh, of the A horizon. Um, that's my approach, um, and I'm sticking with it, and it's been very successful, I think, uh, over the years. Another approach was um, actually uh, <coughs> proposed by uh, my pals, uh, Tom Bowne and uh, Mary Krause um, some years ago. Uh, of pedophases. <coughs> and their idea um, was uh, that we should name paleosols as a distinct kind of sedimentary facies. <coughs> Plus paleosols. Um, you're probably familiar with the idea of sedimentary facies. Uh, I teach it in Geology 2 or 3. Um, most geology courses teach it. A facies is an informal um, unit of uh, rock which is used to um, interpret it. <coughs> they actually named their facies. They, they were working in the uh, Eocene rocks of the Willwood Formation in Wyoming. Um, they had a Sand Creek facies uh, or Sand Creek pedophases. And uh, they also had an Elk Creek pedophases. Um, this is a, uh, a red banded uh, claystones. And these are orange banded. Uh, two quite different uh, kinds of um, uh, kinds of rocks. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, problematic to me uh, because it, it is um, a, a kind of a hybrid uh, unit. Uh, it's it's to me unsuccessful uh, in that even though these are clearly recognizable as different sets of rocks. It doesn't deal with individual profiles. What we're dealing with is a situation, and it's reconstructed by them this way too, where we have a um, a kind of a, a lateral relationship one to another. The sand, the, uh, the, the Elk Creek pedophase is rather here, and the uh, Sand Creek pedophase is uh, out here lateral to what would have been uh, paleo channels. So this is the paleo channel faces. Right there. Um, and this is the Elk Creek pedophases, lateral to the paleo channel. And then as you go further away from the stream, and it gets quite a bit more clay, you go to the Sand Creek pedophases. And there are numerous paleosols in both of these. They're a lot better developed when you get out into the uh, Elk 
into the Sand Creek facies than they are in the Elk Creek facies. Um, I would prefer that they not name them, that they just call them something simple like Red Banded or um, Orange Banded if they want to do them at all. Uh, but it's not my preferred method of um, getting paleoenvironmental information. It only seems to apply to this situation where you have things lateral to a paleo channel. Um, the more general scheme, which is based loosely on um, Sol series uh, mapping, uh, works best for me. Um, and because it emphasizes soils as individuals, soils as uh, something positive, where you can actually recognize an individual soil type instead of an aggregation of soils mixed in uh, with, uh, with sediments. So those are the two approaches widely used uh, for figuring out color environments on uh, soils and mapping and naming them within uh, sedimentary sequences. Uh, perhaps the most widespread use of soils has actually been in stratigraphic studies. Um, in stratigraphic studies, uh, soils have been used um, very, very widely uh, for um, quaternary age uh, rocks, dividing up quaternary age uh, rocks. Um, the rocks of the quaternary are loess and sand and till, and frankly one sand and loess and till looks pretty similar to uh, the other. Um, the really important marker beds um, within quaternary sequences are normally the paleosols that developed um, during times of low deposition uh, between the advances of the ice caps and the blowing of the loess in northern hemisphere countries um, in particular. <coughs> As a stratigraphic unit, <coughs> the word that is commonly used is geosol. Um, it's basically a mappable ancient land surface. Uh, the idea is that we name these things as breaks in sedimentation uh, during the uh, Quaternary. Um, there was a, a, a movement afoot for a while to call these pedoderms. Some people will use that term, not too many though. Um, but it, it had the same kind of um, usage. An example is the Sangamon <coughs> geosol. Um, about 120,000 um, years old. Uh, it's an ancient land surface that's buried in the Luss and Till uh, from um, Illinois and um, Wisconsin all the way south into Louisiana and all the way west into Nebraska. A very <coughs> wide spread ancient land surface which represents the last big interglacial. The last time it was as warm and wet as it is now um, and the, uh, before the maximum advance of the ice uh, between about 70 and um, 10,000 years ago. Uh, that disrupted soil formation fairly extensively. <clears throat> now the GSL is a land surface and that means um, that it will encompass several different lateral variations. It's a whole landscape of soils. So the relationship that you're going to find um, is um, a relationship that's going to be um, like this where you have a lateral variation uh, in the actual soils that are, are formed. Uh, the Sangamon soil, for example, is defined as a red soil. And the type profile, which is actually in Peoria, we often talk about Peoria as a place where uh, you can test uh, traditional values. Um, it's actually just outside of Peoria, Illinois. Uh, that's the red soil. Uh, but there's also gray soils which is called a gumbo till. Um, and it's a gumbo till uh, because it's very clay and boggy 
uh, and is kind of a mess, uh, kind of a mess uh, to deal with. Uh, so um, these are pedotypes. Nobody's named these as pedotypes yet. Um, we just call them, uh, well, we, we can identify them, what they are. Um, uh, this one here is a, um, a hapless doll. And uh, this one here is a, uh, a chromodote. It's a vertisol and an alphasol. And they alternate across the, across the landscape. Um, in uh, a pedotype arrangement. But what's important for stratigraphy is not the lateral variation in the landscape, that's paleoenvironmental information. Isn't it? We go back to pedotypes to do that. Uh, what's important here is that it represents a particular break in sedimentation that has a fairly consistent and long um, duration. And that um, break um, is uh, the Sangamon time, the time of the Sangamon um, geosol. Um, in Peoria, in the in the cuttings around Peoria, uh, we can actually see uh, some a nice section of the um, different uh, kinds of geosols that we have um, in um, Illinois. Uh, here's a uh, cross section of the different sorts of geosols that are in Illinois. Um, at the surface, uh, we have a, a mollusol. And that's on the list. This is silt. This is sand. This is gravel. Um, there can also be a, a little bit of till at this level, like so. So this is a, um, a mollusol. Uh, this is till. It can be thin or thick, uh, but this actually uh, represents uh, one of the last um, glacial advances. Uh, this is a mollusol, the modern soil, uh, a prairie soil. This is what's called Peoriolus. Oh, this whole thing is about three meters in, in thickness. Um, then we have a um, another soil, and then another one. Not so well developed. And then another one, not so well developed. Uh, this has aeolian bedding in it um, and some uh, ripple marks. Uh, this one here is called the Farmdale geosol. This one is not named, that's just the modern soil. Uh, the Farmdale uh, geosol um, is a spodosol. Um, there is the Pleasant Grove geosol. An entosol. Uh, and the Chapin geosol. another endosol. And then below that there is this rather mighty and thick, a meter, two, a meter or two thick, uh, thick soil uh, which is the um, the red Sangamon geosol. Now this pattern of development and we can we can we can probably represent it uh, here is kind of like a barcode. So the mollusol is well developed. Uh, and then we have a poorly developed one here in the Farmdale. Then an even more poorly developed one here, a poorly developed one here, and then a very thickly developed Sangamon paleosol down here, where the width of these bars is the degree of development of um, the paleosol. This is like a barcode. Um, there's more till um, lower down. That would be the glaciation before the Sangamon, um, now talking about uh, 200,000 um, years ago. Um, one can, um, as a quaternary stratigrapher, uh, learn to recognize this barcode um, over hill and dale uh, throughout 
uh, the Midwest. And it's turned out to be um, a very, very effective way of mapping uh, quaternary uh, deposits. Um, you know that when you're at the surface, you're in the Holocene. Uh, you know when you get these weakly developed ones, um, you're within the last glaciation between 70 and 10,000 years ago. And this one is the last interglacial uh, that is 120,000 uh, years ago. And it goes back through the different glacial uh, cycles. Uh, this system of using uh, and naming paleosols, named after locations, uh, again, uh, has been very successful, uh, not only in the Midwest of the U.S. It was actually invented uh, by a farmer from Timaru in New Zealand in the 1890s. And it was used by Russian soil surveyors, starting with Fyofolatkov um, in the 1890s in Russia as well. Um, some of the best work on this kind of um, what we call pedostratigraphy um, has been done in the Czech Republic um, in the great Lewis deposits of the Bohemian uh, platform and going on into uh, Slovakia uh, itself. So that's um, stratigraphic use of, uh, of paleosols, a use of paleosols and naming paleosols for the purpose of finding your way around in a complicated um, and rather monotonous and uniform seeming uh, sediment of uh, mainly quaternary age. Um, although the stratigraphic use of um, paleosols was also applied uh, to uh, some Triassic rocks from Germany at one point, um, we can do that kind of thing um, with really ancient rocks as well. Um, but um, only a few people have tried that. It's not really all that necessary uh, since uh, uh, geologists have already defined uh, stratigraphic names and um, their subdivisions are fairly, uh, fairly final. Um, a third use is geological maps. Now, it turns out that uh, paleosols are almost always too thin uh, to appear on a geological uh, map. Uh, paleosols are uh, generally less than a meter thick. Uh, and if we mapped every unit a meter thick, uh, on a geological map, say a two inch to the mile sheet even, um, it would look pretty busy. It would be pretty hard to understand. Generally speaking, when we're mapping uh, geology, um, we um, need to have uh, units that are uh, mappable on that scale and at least four to 20 meters or so uh, thick. Um, the uh, So paleosols generally tend to be within particular named uh, formations. And as the example of uh, pedophases unit uh, shows, um, different uh, formations generally have different kinds of paleosols, and so it's pretty easy to distinguish one from another. The Elk Creek faces and the Sand Creek faces in the Woolwood Basin are side by side, and so that's a bit confusing. But in places like the Badlands of South Dakota, the Shadron Formation at the bottom has a very different assemblage of um, paleosols, and it's a red banded faces, kind of like uh, the Sand Creek faces. Uh, the Senec member um, in the next unit up of the Rural Formation is uh, more like the Elk Creek faces. So in, in that case, even the members have been named according to their paleosol characteristics. The Shadron is red banded, the Senec member is um, yellow and brown banded, and they were named as particular, um, particular uh, members of um, their respective uh, formations uh, that are each uh, about 20, 30 meters or so thick. Um, now, um, a particular problem emerged in the mapping of uh, South West Queensland uh, by um, Senior and Mabbitt. Um, their job was to make a geological map of, um, of Queensland. Um, and what they found um, in this rather low desert uh, terrain was that there were these super thick paleosols ranging from uh, four uh, to 
um, 20 meters thick individual paleosols. Um, these are the sorts of soils that are formed in a tropical climate, um, probably of the past, but Queensland still is pretty hot. Um, and um, they are therefore deeply weathered and uh, thick enough to appear as if they are geologic units on a geologic map and they need um, they need a name. They decided to call them just profiles and so they named the Curali Silkrete profile for example. Um, they uh, called it a profile, they gave it a locality name uh, this is what it basically uh, is. Uh, and they did a type section. Um, so um, this was about four meters or so thick. This whole profile now. Um, sandy at the top and then going down into mottled material and then basically Cretaceous shale. So Cretaceous shale uh, down here um, deeply weathered material here which is tending to be somewhat clay 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 and then sandy 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 sandy, sandy. Um, deeply weathered, um, mottled, meaning it has spots of color, not uniformly colored, mottled uh, spots of red, um, and then um, silkrete, basically a sand that is cemented with, uh, with silica. Uh, quite a thick uh, sandy deposit that is absolutely firm um, with uh, silkrete. Uh, this silkrete makes them very, very hard. And so these silkretes actually uh, turn out to be the easiest things in the world in, in Queensland to map because um, this stuff is very um, easily weathered. So is the Cretaceous shell. It tends to have very low relief. And these silkretes form ridges across the landscape, um, five, six meters tall, standing high above um, the the plane of these more weathered uh, of these more weathered rocks. Uh, silkretes are, of course, uh, uh, rocks that are rich in uh, silica. <coughs> uh, it's probably not a whole profile. It's probably a weathering residuum. There may have been another profile up the top uh, that, uh, that formed it. Um, their origins are relatively uh, complicated. Um, the great depth of weathering reflects a long time of uh, formation. Queensland is a very stable, cratonic uh, setting where there's not too much uplift, there's not too much subsidence. Um, it's been just weathering for a long, long time and um, often in a fairly severe tropical environment. Um, they found other sorts of uh, profiles too, or profiles in the specific sense. They found calcretes. Calcrete is a rock which is cemented with calcite, CaCO3. Um, these uh, cements have the same effect as the silkrete uh, and will make something be quite a stout ridge. Some of these calcretes are 10 meters thick, just a strongly cemented rock with calcrete, usually above a mottled or a weathered zone. Um, and uh, these are um, named by a different uh, locality and different type uh, profile. They also describe laterites, uh, which are cemented by Fe2O3 by hematite. Um, and um, uh, with uh, kaolinite clays and other deeply weathered uh, clays. Um, these are in some cases whole profiles which have a plinthite. I talked about those before. These are sometimes fossil oxisols which have hardened up under the sun of um, Australia. 
Uh, and they also found uh, bauxites cemented with Al2O3, um, which as a mineral is bermite. This is hematite. This is bermite. Uh, this is calcite. Uh, the bauxites also form these very, very thick uh, profiles probably formed largely in oxisols under uh, a very aggressive uh, tropical weathering uh, regime. Uh, bauxites are, of course, quite important as um, ores of um, aluminum. Um, very uh, thick deposits in Queensland are found around Weeper and remain one of the best sources of aluminum ore uh, in, um, in the world. A very valuable. Uh, resource for uh, for aluminum. Now, there's a difficulty with all of this. Um, you have to call them a profile rather than a formation or a member because they have a sharp top and a gradational uh, bottom. So um, it's quite possible, for example, to have here's a coesta, um, a um, an erosional ridge. Uh, with a silcrete here, and um, with a um, laterite here. So these things, these profiles, do not obey the normal laws of uh, superposition. Um, they do not have a bottom. So that they're not being deposited on some surfaces, they're actually differentiating from the top down. So it's quite possible, and in large areas of Queensland it's demonstrated that the silcrete actually is overlapping a pre-existing uh, laterite. The silcrete we think is probably Miocene in age, the laterite is probably Oligocene in age. Um, the fact that it's not being deposited on a surface and has a bounded top and a bottom means that you need to have um, a terminology like a profile rather than calling them particular geological um, members. Um, the other thing, of course, is that they formed at a particular time uh, which is uh, unrelated uh, to um, the Cretaceous Shale um, down in here, down at the bottom. Uh, this is Miocene shale up here. Um, these uh, different shale beds, uh, which in part form the parent material, um, are of uh, different ages as well. Uh, so it's not appropriate to use normal stratigraphic terms like members to describe these things. Um, I have the map in, the in my textbook of the, the map that Senior Mavit did, and really very large areas of Queensland are dominated by these overlapping profiles of um, often three or four different kinds, um, and uh, it makes for a complicated geological interpretation uh, that is not unravelable using a straight up member. Uh, classification. Uh, this profile terminology uh, based on a type section um, is a perfectly scientific approach um, that is quite useful in these sorts of situations. It has not been widely um, applied though. Um, perhaps the most widely applied um, uh, approaches so far are the pedotype approach uh, which I have used a lot and the geosol approach which is most widely used by Quaternary stratigraphers. So uh, there is a method to our madness in paleopodology. We do have ways of naming and of mapping and of characterizing, particularly using type sections, our particular profiles in order to understand them. And uh, that'll do it for today. Thanks for your attention.